Hello there, my dears. <laughs> yes, it's me, Menopause Taylor. I've just aged quite a bit, and I gained quite a bit of weight, too. I guess I'm just an old, fat female. Of course, you know that my costume always has something to do with the lesson of the video, and today is no different. We are tackling a unit on endometrial uterine cancer that began just three videos ago with video number 320. Video 320 was on the anatomy of your uterus and endometrial uterine cancer. Video 321 was on the incidence and prevalence of endometrial uterine cancer. And this video, 322, is the one which will address the risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer. In other words, I'll tell you how to know if you're at risk for endometrial uterine cancer. Now, boy, it sure is hard to move in the midst of that. In my book, first edition and second edition, this is chapter 31, all of which is on endometrial uterine cancer. And today's material is in the section entitled Risk Factors. But you will have much more fun by watching this video. Not only do you get to see me dressed as an old, fat female, you will also understand why I'm dressed <laughs> as an old, fat female. And you will probably never, ever forget the risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer. Okay, let's begin. If you've been watching all my videos in order, as you should, you know that I cover everything in very complete units. I've given you entire units on all the diseases that are due to estrogen deficiency. They include heart attacks, osteoporosis, and Alzheimer's disease. And in each of those units, I gave you a video on the risk factors for that particular disease. You saw that all three of the diseases that are due to estrogen deficiency have long lists of risk factors. There are 15 risk factors for a heart attack. There are 19 risk factors for osteoporosis. And there are 26 risk factors for Alzheimer's. With all three of those diseases, you have a whole host of things you can do to lower your risk simply because there are so many risk factors. Well, with endometrial uterine cancer, the list of risk factors is very short. It consists of only three things. And today, I represent all three. I'm an old, fat female. That's who gets endometrial uterine cancer. Old, fat females. I guess we could use the acronym OFF, or OFF, as an easy way to remember them. Old, fat, female. So let me address each of these three risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer. The first risk factor is age, more specifically, old age. Endometrial uterine cancer is a disease of older women. By older, I mean midlife middle age, and beyond. It is extremely rare to see endometrial uterine cancer in a woman under the age of 45. Women in the under 45 age range constitute only 8% of endometrial uterine cancers. All the rest occur in women over age 45. And the incidence of endometrial uterine cancer increases with age. Under the age of 40, your risk is 1 in 1,423. In your 60s, your risk is 1 in 166. In your 70s, your risk is 1 in 81. And in your 80s, your risk is 1 in 75. But it isn't exactly a case of the older you get, the higher your risk, and that's that. There are other factors that play into the picture. 70% of 
of endometrial and uterine cancers occur in women between the ages of 45 and 74. But the vast majority of women who get endometrial uterine cancer are diagnosed with it when they are perimenopausal or postmenopausal between the ages of 50 and 65. The average age of diagnosis for endometrial uterine cancer is 61. And another good depiction of the effect of your age on your risk of endometrial uterine cancer is by using percentages. Here's a table that gives you the percentage of endometrial uterine cancers distributed by age. Now, don't make the mistake of assuming that this is a chart of your personal percentage risk of getting endometrial uterine cancer based on age. This chart is not about you or even risk. It's about the percentage of already existing endometrial uterine cancers by age. But if we plot the age distribution of both actual endometrial cancer cases and your actual risk of ever getting endometrial uterine cancer, it would look like this. Imagine Age range, ages ranging from 20 to 80 across the horizontal lower x-axis. I couldn't figure out how to make them show. I'm just too old to understand all this technology. So the age distribution for both actual cases and for your risk of getting into mature uterine cancer is really a bell-shaped curve. That's what any old lady would do at this point. <laughs> so now you understand why I'm dressed to be old. Age is one of the three risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer. The second risk factor for endometrial uterine cancer is fat, otherwise known as obesity. But the word obesity doesn't fit with our nifty little acronym OFF. Off. The O is for old, and the first F is for fat. When it comes to being fat, the fatter you are, the higher your risk for endometrial uterine cancer. Fat accounts for 17 to 46 percent of all cases of endometrial uterine cancer. Of course, it's all a matter of degree. Degree of fat, that is. When it comes to being fat, we have parameters for how we label each category. It's based on your body mass index, or BMI. BMI is something that is very easy to calculate. All you have to know is your height and your weight. And you can calculate it using either the metric system or the imperial system. For the metric system, which is the easiest, the equation is your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. For the imperial system used in the United States, it's a bit more math. The equation is your weight in pounds divided by your height in inches squared. And then you multiply the whole thing by 703. And your BMI units will be in mass, which is kilogram per meter squared. Once you have your answer from that equation, you just classify yourself according to the following chart. If your BMI is less than 18.5, you are underweight. And as an old fat female, I'd advise you to fatten up. If your BMI is between 18.5 and 24.9, you're normal weight. But as an old fat female, you'd still look pretty skinny to me. If your BMI is between 25 and 29.9, you're overweight. And as an old fat female, I'd say you're just starting to look healthy. If your BMI is between 30 and 34.9, you're obese. 
I don't know about you, but I think the word obese is just plain obscene. I think that category should be redesignated as pleasantly plump. If your BMI is between 35 and 39.9, you're morbidly obese. Why did they have to include the word morbid? It just sounds so fatalistic. If your BMI is over 40, you're morbidly, morbidly obese. Uh, that would mean you're a lot like me. And I find it very offensive that the already fatalistic word morbid is double as if it's doubly fatal. But I'm just in denial because if you are overweight with a BMI between 25 and 29.9, you have a two-time increase in risk of getting endometrial uterine cancer. And if you are obese, with a BMI between 30 and 34.9, you have a five times the risk. If you are morbidly obese with a BMI over 35, you have six times the risk. In essence, for every five kilograms per meter squared increase in your BMI, your risk rises. This fat risk factor really follows you throughout your entire lifetime. And the degree to which you gain weight throughout your life is highly predictive of the risk for endometrial uterine cancer. If you gain large quantities of weight during your adult life, you are at high risk. And the longer you have remained fat, the higher your risk. So if you've struggled with your weight all or most of your life, give this factor a lot of weight. Uh, I guess that wasn't the best word choice. Or, actually, it might have been the very perfect word choice. And another thing. The earlier in life you were fat, the earlier you are likely to have endometrial uterine cancer. Women who are fat in their 20s are diagnosed with endometrial uterine cancer an average of 10 years earlier than women who are not fat in their 20s. And if you just remain fat all the time, your risk is five times higher than that for women of normal weight. And this risk factor of fat has a strong bearing on other aspects of endometrial uterine cancer too. Fat increases the mortality rate from endometrial uterine cancer. I guess that's why they use the word morbid for a high BMI. And one more thing about being fat. It somewhat overtakes the risk factor of age. In other words, endometrial uterine cancer is normally a disease of women over the age of 45. But if you're a young woman, your fat can trump your age. And you can more easily get endometrial uterine cancer at an age younger than 45. This means that fat is a stronger risk factor for endometrial uterine cancer than age. It turns out that fat is such a strong risk factor that there are huge differences in the incidence of endometrial uterine cancer in different countries depending on how fat people are in that country. So if you divide countries into those that are skinny countries versus those that are fat countries, the incidence of endometrial uterine cancer is on the order of less than two cases per 100,000 women in the skinny countries and greater than 16 cases to 100,000 women in the fat country. We now know that being fat is a result of living more industrialized lifestyles. In the last unit on cancer in general, I referred to cancer as a disease of civilization. Well, being fat is a disease of civilization too. So this fat factor carries a lot of weight indeed. All right, now for the third risk factor, being female. It's the second F of our acronym, O, F, F. This risk factor goes way back to the very basics. The first basic thing is the obvious fact that you only have a uterus if you're female. But it goes beyond that too. 
Way back in previous videos, I explained the roles of the three sex hormones by using these props. Mama bear, papa bear, and baby bear. These are the three bears from Goldilocks and the three bears. And I love using them to demonstrate the roles of the three sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. Just as each of the three bears had his or her own bed, chair, and forage, each bear also has his or her own sex hormone. Testosterone is Papa Bear's hormone. It's what makes him Papa Bear. Estrogen is Mama Bear's hormone. It's what makes her Mama Bear. And progesterone is Baby Bear's hormone. It's what makes it possible for him to remain in utero long enough to become Baby Bear. So this third risk factor of being female is really all about estrogen. Simply put, excess estrogen causes endometrial uterine cancer. Now, recognize that all three of the big diseases we've addressed before in this unit are due to estrogen deficiency. But now you have the first and only disease that is due to estrogen excess. Recall video 102, which was entitled, Which Cancer is Caused by Estrogen, Uterine or Breast? We discovered that despite all the hype that exists about estrogen and breast cancer, estrogen does not meet any of the criteria as a causative agent for breast cancer. But it meets all of them for endometrial uterine cancer. And if you reflect back on video 320 on the anatomy of your uterus and uterine cancer, you learn that the very cells that transform into uterine cancer cells are the endometrial columnar glandular cells that line the inside of your uterus. That's why it's called endometrial uterine cancer. Estrogen causes the lining inside your uterus to thicken. This is true regardless of your age, regardless of your reproductive status, regardless of your weight. Remember this? This is a Play-Doh graph of a menstrual cycle. And notice that the first half of every menstrual cycle is the very result of excess estrogen, which is in pink. And excess estrogen is what causes your uterine lining to thicken. I can demonstrate that with this. So this is what estrogen does to your uterus. It makes it thick. Or I can demonstrate it with this. This is a uterus, and it shows the thick lining here. I have all kinds of props to show this. I can even show it to you like this. Estrogen is the fertilizer that makes the lining inside your uterus grow and get thick, just like it's fertilizer that makes grass grow. No matter how you look at it, excess estrogen is the culprit in causing endometrial uterine cancer. Now, have you noticed that I keep saying excess estrogen? What do you suppose I mean by that? As mama bear, you're supposed to have estrogen. Without it, you couldn't ovulate, and a fertilized egg would not have a cushion in which to implant in your uterus. And you'd have all the symptoms of estrogen deficiency, and you develop all the diseases of, of estrogen deficiency. So estrogen is not bad. The reason I keep saying estrogen excess is because your risk of endometrial uterine cancer is all about balancing estrogen with progesterone. Even though progesterone is baby bear's hormone and does nothing at all for you personally, the one benefit it offers you is the sloughing of that thickened uterine lining if it is not necessary to cushion a developing fetus. So while estrogen does this, progesterone does this to the lining inside the uterus. And while estrogen does 
this progesterone does this. And while estrogen does this, progesterone does this. It's like a lawnmower. So just no matter how you look at it, it's the estrogen that causes uterine cancer and it's the progesterone that prevents it. Now please, please do not use the absurd term estrogen dominance instead of using the term estrogen excess. Estrogen dominance is not even a term we have in medicine. I gave you three separate videos on estrogen dominance. They were videos 74, 75, and 76. In those three videos, I tried my best to purge you of the term estrogen dominance. You should never, ever, ever use it. It makes you appear very uneducated. Estrogen dominance is a term that was made up by the alternative community to scare women away from estrogen and promote progesterone. It was a marketing toy, and boy, did it work. But, as I just explained, as mama bear, you are automatically estrogen dominant. Being estrogen dominant does not cause gynecologic problems as claimed by the creators of the term. Throughout your reproductive life, during every menstrual cycle, you have higher levels of estrogen than progesterone half the time. So it just doesn't make sense to think of estrogen dominance as an abnormal or problematic thing. But estrogen excess is a different matter. It means that you have estrogen in excess of progesterone. And the only disease process it causes is uterine cancer, specifically endometrial uterine cancer. So frankly, you should just throw out the term estrogen dominance, all, dominance altogether. It is an illogical, unsophisticated, and misleading term. Now, if we parlay this risk factor of X, Excess estrogen with our other two risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer, you discover that it wins over all of them. When you're young and you have menstrual cycles, the monthly shedding of your uterine lining prevents endometrial uterine cancer. That's why endometrial uterine cancer is so rare in young women. But if a young woman has excess estrogen and does not shed her thickened uterine lining, she too can get endometrial uterine cancer. And when it comes to being fat, there's a double win. If you think back to video 32 on bioidentical estrogens for menopause or to video 284 on why compounded bioidentical hormone replacement therapy doesn't cut it, for preventing the three big diseases of estrogen deficiency. You'll remember that your body produces three different kinds of estrogen. It produces estrone in your fat cells to make you fatter. It produces estradiol in your ovaries to make you ovulate, thicken your uterine lining, and prevent the symptoms and diseases of estrogen deficiency. And it produces estriol to support a pregnancy. Well, you obviously don't make estriol when you're not pregnant. So that one's not hanging around to increase your risk of endometrial uterine cancer. And you have ample evidence from your symptoms of estrogen deficiency that you've lost all your estradiol. But estrone is still on board. It's in your fat cells, and you're getting fatter as you age. And it's those fat cells that are producing the excess estrogen in the form of estrone. So being fat really weighs heavily. And when we get to the portion of this unit that addresses management options, I'll talk about the role of progesterone. Today, I'm limiting my discussion to risk factors. So if you're inclined to ask, what about prevention? Just hold your horses. So there are only three established risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer, and I represent all of them in my costume today. 
They include being old, fat, and female, or all. You just have to remember that the F for female really pertains to excess estrogen. But separate from these three established risk factors, there are some associations between certain factors and endometrial eating cancer. I gave you an entire video on the differences in the meanings of the words cause, risk, association, and link. That was video 157. Now, why do you suppose I did that? So that you'd understand the differences at times like this when the differences matter. So let me review. The word cause means that something sets the stage and begins the process for a specific outcome. Cause results directly in that outcome. Risk assesses how likely you are to get a disease. As you've seen, the more risk factors you have for a disease, the more likely you are to get that disease. Association means connection or contribution. It means that two things are commonly found together. It means that there is a good likelihood that if you have one, you'll have the other. But it does not mean that one causes the other. And it does not necessarily mean that one puts you at high risk for the other. A link is a step in a process or a small part of an overall result. But that does not mean that any one link causes the chain to be a chain. Likewise, one link between something and a disease does not suffice to cause the disease. It also does not mean that the chain can't exist if you remove one of the links. So in addition to the three established risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer, there are a few associations that are important. I'll just list them for you first, and then I'll tell you how they are associated with endometrial uterine cancer. They are race, your menstrual life, diabetes, polycystic ovary syndrome, and use of tamoxifen for treating or preventing breast cancer. The first association is race. Endometrial uterine cancer is more associated with white women than it is with black women. The second association is your menstrual life. There is an association with the number of periods you've had and endometrial uterine cancer. The more periods you've had, the more endometrial cancers. Anything that increases the number of periods you've had is associated with endometrial uterine cancer, including having your first period at a younger age, never having had children, or having your last period and becoming postmenopausal at a later age. The third association is diabetes. There is a strong association between diabetes type 2 and endometrial uterine cancer. But of course, this is probably due to the likelihood of being fat if you have diabetes type 2. So this association is a combination of being insulin resistant and being fat. The fourth association is polycystic ovary syndrome. The acronym for that is PCOS. 30% of women with endometrial uterine cancer also have PCOS. But this may be due to the fact that women with PCOS are commonly fat and have diabetes type 2. And a fifth association is for the use of tamoxifen for treating or preventing breast cancer. And this one has to do with the fact that tamoxifen acts like an estrogen on your inner uterine lining to thicken it just like estrogen does. Use of tamoxifen, tamoxifen for either treatment or prevention of breast cancer increases your risk of endometrial uterine cancer by as much as six times. Like I always say, your menopause management is always going to boil down to trade-offs. So that leaves you with three established risk factors and five associations for endometrial uterine cancer. All told, they are being old, being fat, and being female as the risk factors, and being white, having had many periods, 
having diabetes type 2, having PCOS, and taking tamoxifen as the association. Now notice what is not on either list. HRT. Most women assume that HRT will increase their risk of endometrial uterine cancer, but the exact opposite is true. As long as you balance estrogen and progesterone, you decrease your risk. And this goes for birth control that contains both estrogen and progesterone also. Turns out that if you use estrogen and progesterone birth control for over 12 years, it decreases your risk of endometrial uterine cancer by 70%. So as long as you balance your estrogen and progesterone, HRT decreases your risk for endometrial uterine cancer. And this goes for both HRT and birth control, as long as they both contain estrogen and progesterone. I think it's very important to pay attention to such things. Here's a simple chart of this information. You can find it in, via the link in the description box or on my website, which is menopausetaylor.me. It simply lists the three risk factors and their role in increasing the risk of endometrial uterine cancer and the five associations along with how they are associated with endometrial uterine cancer. So unlike the long lists of risk factors for some other diseases, the list is short for endometrial uterine cancer. If you just remember our acronym OFF for old fat female, you'll have no trouble remembering them. Okay, dearies, I'm an old fat female and I'm tired, so I will sign off. Next week, we will put estrogen to the test as a causative agent of endometrial uterine cancer. Should you need me for anything, please go to menopausetaylor.me. And this old fat female will be delighted to help you with anything your heart desires. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. But do so, I mean, if you're going to follow me, do so when you're not in a hurry. <laughs> because I move slowly. <laughs> and do this old fat female a favor by subscribing to my channel and my newsletter. I'll take care of my good old fat self until next week. And you do the same. Bye!